Welcome back to another video lecture. I'm putting together a series of these video lectures for class and uh, this is the second video lecture on conformity research. The previous lecture focused on the research of Musafar Sharif and you should view that lecture first before viewing this one. Uh, this lecture is on Solomon Ash. Uh, chronologically Ash came a number of years later. It's clear that Ash was influenced by Sharif's work and in fact, Ash cites Sharif's autokinetic effects studies extensively in his writings. Uh, a little bit of background about Ash. Uh, Ash's family was Polish and Jewish, and they lived in, in Poland. Uh, immigrated in 1907 to the United States, where they moved to New York City. Uh, and at this point in time, Ash was 13 years old. Uh, this photograph shows uh, part of the Lower East Side it's probably Orchard Street, but I'm not entirely certain of that. Uh, I might be able to do a little research and find out. Uh, but this uh, this particular photograph dates to 1908. So it's it's a little bit before Ash got to the Lower East Side, but this is the typical scene uh, that you would have experienced in that uh, neighborhood, uh, even through the 1940s and 50s. In fact, when I was... Uh, Growing up in New York City in the 1970s and 80s, I used to go to the same neighborhood, perhaps even the same block, uh, and some of these types of uh, storefronts were still visible at that point in time. They're all long gone now. But in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the Lower East Side of Manhattan was a haven for Jewish immigrants from all across Europe, and they would um, uh, frequently open up businesses and uh, sometimes become quite successful. Some of those businesses still exist today, but uh, they're getting uh, much more rare as, as rent uh, cost of rents uh, uh, skyrocket and they all get shut down. But it's, it's, you can see that it's a vibrant, thriving community. It was also an intellectual uh, bastion for Jewish immigrants. Uh, Ash himself was academically inclined and he went to Columbia University in New York City, uh, which is the same university that Sharif got his dissertation at in 1935. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of a lineage going on here. Uh, Ash did not have direct mentorship with Sharif, but it's uh, you can say that the, the two of them are coming from a similar school of thought. Uh, if anything, Ash was more heavily influenced by sociologists. In fact, he studied under a couple of the premier sociologists of the first half of the 20th century, Franz Boas and Ruth Benedict. They, they were pivotal figures in, in the discipline of sociology. He was also influenced by Max Wertheimer, who was a founder of Gestalt psychology. So, uh, in 1955, Ash published uh, this paper in Scientific American, uh, it was his attempt to do the same type of thing that uh, that Musafar Sharif had done with the autokinetic effects study. The problem with the Sharif study is that the reality of that movement of light was really ambiguous. It, it seemed to be moving a bit, but it was very hard to tell. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't moving at all. What Ash wanted to do was set up a situation where it was obvious that the group was wrong and that the the true participant would have to decide whether or not to go along and conform with the group or to say the correct answer uh, when going against the group. I mean, if you think about the Sharif autokinetic effects study where reality is ambiguous, if everybody else is saying the same thing and you go along with them, there's really no pressure against doing that there's really no pressure because there is no observably correct or incorrect answer. But what happens if the group is clearly wrong in the thing that they are saying? Uh, now the participant would have a much more difficult task at hand when he or she is deciding whether or not to go along with the group. So that's that's essentially the paradigm that Ash wanted to set up. And he did it in this way. Here's a photograph of the the people in the experiment, and I would say that this is a typical uh, lineup for Ash's study. Uh, he did a number of different variations of the study, so it wasn't always exactly like this, but this is somewhat typical. So you have a, 
a set of people, in this photograph it's all men, but uh, Ash also experimented with female participants in some of the studies, so it's not, it's not strictly all white males. Uh, but that's what was available at Columbia University, presumably. So what you see here is uh, the set of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven young men lined up at a table, and there's Ash seated at the table on the far right-hand side. There was a little bit of trickery involved here in the sense that Ash informed the subject the wrong time for the experiment to start. And in this way, the subject always arrives a couple of minutes late. And then Ash would say something to the effect of, well, the experiment's already started. Uh, people are seated at the table, but you can go ahead and join them. So we're just about to, uh, to get on with things. And in this way, <clears throat> he was able to always get the true subject to sit at the end of the table or next to the end of the table. And what I mean by that is that all the other people are Confederates working for Ash. When you look at subject number one on the left-hand side, number two, number three, number four, and number five, those people are all Confederates working for Ash. And number seven at the very end of the table is also a confederate. The only person here who's a true subject is the guy with a puzzled look on his face, subject number six, with a short sleeve shirt and a tie. Uh, and you can see that he's uh, looking a little bit perplexed by things. And, and so that's the typical setup. You have one real subject and uh, depending on the design of the version of the experiment, perhaps uh, six confederates or seven confederates uh, depending on what's available. Now every time they did this, every time Ash did the experimental situation, he had to uh, utilize new actors. You can only test one subject at a time doing this and it would take a few minutes to run the trial. Uh, so this was a very time consuming experiment and it also depended on having these actors available. One of the things that Ash mentioned in one of his writings was that at some points in time after debriefing the real subject, he would give the real subject an opportunity to join the experiment as a confederate. Uh, and that way when some of his actors, when some of Ash's actors were not available to keep going with the experiment, <clears throat> he would uh, pick up some former experimental subjects and have them uh, now playing the role of actors. Presumably these people don't really know each other very well. They might have seen each other on campus. Uh, they're undergraduate students, but uh, presumably they don't know each other by first name or anything like that. Okay, so the experimental task involved looking at lines on boards like this. This is the example given in the 1955 paper where you have uh, three lines together on one side, numbers one, two, and three, and then one line on the uh, other side. These are separate boards the participant is tasked with choosing which of these three lines matches the single line on the left. Uh, we can say that uh, uh, the numbered lines are the comparison lines and the single line is the target. So uh, which of these three comparison lines matches the target line? Uh, there are 12 different versions, uh, which is to say there are 12 different boards that are replaced 12 different trials. And at each trial, uh, Ash would go down the group having each participant at the table giving their answers. Uh, and it was also rigged so that the person on the far left side would give the answer first and then the you know following in sequence around the table. And all of those people are confederates until you get to subject number six, uh, who's the only true subject. So you'd have the first person say the answer, then the second person says the same thing, and the third person, and so on, and then it's your turn. Now the first two trials, trial number one and trial number two, everybody says the correct answer, and if this were the stimulus board that was uh, being used at that point in time, the correct answer is two. But on the third trial, and from then on, uh, with some exceptions, the other uh, uh, people in the room, the Confederates, all start saying the wrong line. But it remember that it changes every time. It's a different set of lines every time. 
Uh, but if this were uh, the set of lines being used on one of the trials where the Confederates give the wrong answer, the first person might say that the correct answer is number three. And then the second, the second person would say also number three, and so on. The wrong answers by the group were unanimous in the sense that all the Confederates always said the same thing, at least in this version of the experiment. So now um, five people have all said that the correct answer is number three, but in fact it's number two. You can see it with your own eyes. It's easy to see. What do you do? Do you go along with the group or do you stand up for yourself and say the correct answer? Here's another photograph of that participant, number six, who is apparently, you know, looking very carefully at those lines in order to see what the other people see. The participant is put into this weird position, this weird situation, where something that is very obvious and clear uh, is clearly wrong, where the group is saying the wrong thing. And this is sort of a weird thing to experience, where all the people around you who have clear eyesight, presumably, who are rational individuals, are all saying the wrong thing, and you can see that they're wrong, and now you have to decide whether or not you're going to go along with the group, or whether or not you're going to uh, go against the group and say the correct answer. Now, periodically throughout the experiment, the group would uh, return to saying the right answer. So in trial number one and trial number two, they would say the right answer. Uh, and then a little bit further on, at trial number five, they would again say the right answer. Trial number eight and number 11, they would again say the right answer. So there are five trials in which they say the correct answer. There are 12 trials total, and that leaves seven trials in which the group says the wrong answer. There's seven opportunities for each individual subject to either conform to the group opinion or uh, remain independent of the group opinion. So Ash was very interested in tabulating these results and uh, there are a couple of tables that I'll talk about uh, from the 1955 paper and then a few tables that I retrieved from elsewhere. What we see on the left-hand side in, in this chart, we have the critical trials, number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Those are the 12 trials. Remember that the first two are trials in which the uh, group says the correct answer. And then you have uh, correct estimates in percentage points. Uh, that's the, that shows of the 123 participants, how many were correct in their observations. You can see that things take a big dive at trial number four, uh, and then again in trial number eight. And on the right-hand side, a different graph where what Ash has done is he's collapsed a number of different experiments together, a number of different versions, where you have uh, varying numbers of opponents. And if you have only a single opponent, there's a very small rate of error. The height of the uh, uh, the height of the line on this graph indicates the higher amount of error in percent. So if there's only one opponent, uh, almost no one makes an error. If there are two opponents, you can see that this, uh, the amount of error is going up. Uh, three opponents, now you have about 30% of uh, trials uh, having a, uh, an error being reported by one of the subjects. Uh, but you reach a peak, and you never really go above that peak of about 35%. So about 35% is about as high as you can get. Ash went on to, uh, in 1952, publish, <coughs> actually, it's, so it's, a, you know, this is a series of experiments that's going on for a number of years. The Scientific American article is from 1955. Uh, but Ash's social psychology textbook was originally published in 1952 republished in 1987, that's the copy that I have, and he goes on at great length talking about this series of experiments, and there are a couple of uh, graphs that I want to talk about uh, to help us understand what's going on. So now let's take a look at one of these graphs from his textbook. Uh, what we have on the x-axis is the number of errors, and on the y-axis the number of subjects in percentage points. 
uh, it's kind of weird when you have both the word number and then percent. Uh, uh, <laughs> this kind of contradict a little bit. But at any rate, so what we're looking at on the y-axis is percentage of subjects. And the way to read this from the left-hand side, if we're looking just at the solid line, which is the critical group, that's the group that we just described, where you have uh, you know six confederates saying the wrong answer and one true subject. About 19% of the time, you have zero errors. That's where the solid line starts on the left-hand side. About 19% of the uh, subjects provide zero errors. That's, that's the reading of it. 19% were right all the time. And about 23%, it looks like, gave a wrong answer once. You've got 12 trials, seven chances to have an error, because uh, in the other five trials, the uh, Confederates gave the right answers. Going on to two errors, we've got about 20% of the subjects have an error on two trials, uh, and so on. It looks like it's around 0% of participants gave an error uh, five or six times. And then at the very end, you've got, I don't know, maybe 5% of the subjects caved in every time. How do we interpret this? There, there is a strong sense of independence for most of the participants. Most of the participants gave zero errors, one or two errors. And for a small number of people, uh, they conform all the time. Uh, but it's a very small minority. And then you've got something in the middle with the three, four errors, the, the number of people who gave three or four errors. That's about 15% each. 15% of the subjects gave an error on three or four out of their seven trials. I, I guess the way to interpret this is that for most of the individuals, there's they, they are independent of the group and the group opinion. For some individuals, they cave in some of the time and for a very small number of individuals, they cave in all the time. Here's a, uh, a scan of one of the pages from his text. And uh, it says, no subject disregards the group judgments. Although the task calls for independent judgments, virtually no one looks upon the estimates of the group with indifference or as irrelevant. Each immediately grasps the estimates of the others in their relation to his own estimates. Further, the responses that the critical subject hears are not so many separate responses, each of which happens to coincide with the others and to diverge from his own. And I underlined this point. This is particularly important. He, the subject, he notes immediately the convergence of the group responses and his divergence from them and the contradiction between these. Now, the diagram here is rather nice, I think. Uh, when you look at it, there's not a whole lot to it, but the, uh, the diagram uh, has, I think, a great importance. What you see is that you have this group of arrows all pointing to the same reality, or all pointing to the same answer. You have unanimity of answers among the Confederates, and the true subject is off by him or herself. Now, how does it feel to be off by yourself when everybody else is saying something different? It, it's not an easy thing to do. And that's what Ash was really quite interested in. He was interested in how people deal with a situation. Here's another uh, table from his text. Uh, this one has the distribution of critical errors in older and younger groups. I added this one because you can see a developmental trend, and I thought this would be particularly interesting for school psychology students. On the left-hand side, you have the college group, uh, and on the far left, you have the number of errors. Remember that there's seven possible chances to be correct or incorrect. So for the college group, what we see is that six of the 31 subjects has zero errors. Seven of the 31 subjects has one error. Six have two errors, and so on. And there are two subjects who have seven errors. So for the, for the most part, among the college students, most of the participants have very few errors, and some have none at all. 
there's a very small minority of people among the college students uh, who have uh, conformed a, a great deal, either six or seven. But that's, that's only three people. Only three out of 31 conformed six or seven times out of uh, that number of opportunities to be wrong. Now when you compare that to these other versions of the experiment that utilize children, we have 10 to 13 year olds in the middle uh, table and then in the cell on the uh, right hand side 7 to 10 year olds. So you can see a, a clear developmental uh, trend here. With the youngest children in the 7 to 10 uh, age group, 26 percent, or 10 out of 38, were wrong 7 out of 7 times. That is to say they are going along with the group. And it's the minority who are independent all the time. Only 3 out of 38 of those youngest children were uh, reporting the correct answer all the time. We're giving the accurate answer without going uh, into conform to the group opinion. And then the the middle-aged children, the 10 to 13 year olds, you see that it's a little bit a little bit more like the adult pattern uh, but still you've got a, a fairly high rate of conformity uh, but it's sort of a, a bimodal distribution with a peak at the lower end I should say a peak at the top of the uh, table where you have very few errors and then another peak at the bottom. So we have a clear developmental pattern uh, indicating that uh, younger children are more apt to conform to the group than older children are. Now there are a couple of other points to make here before uh, moving on to some other research. Uh, one of these points is that Ash felt that these two forces were diametrically opposed. On the one hand, you have the urge to be accurate in your reporting of information. And on the other hand, diametrically opposed to that is the urge to be a member of the group. Ash did not consider conformity be, to be a negative thing. In fact, uh, it's quite clear in his writing that what Ash was really interested in is how people get along, not how people cave in. The predominant viewpoint in social psychology in the first half of the 20th century, aside for Ash, was that people were slavish uh, robots that um, conformed to groups without uh, thinking about things. Stanley Milgram sort of comes out of that viewpoint as well with his, his obedience research. He, he, didn't, he wanted to show that people were uh, slavishly obedient to authority figures, even if those authority figures we're telling them to do uh, things that were unethical. It, that's, a, that's a big topic and a, probably a topic for another day. But what Ash was really interested in is how people feel so strongly that they need to get along. And, and this, is, this is part of our society. This is part of the way that society functions. According to Ash, if you didn't have conformity, uh, the, the entire society, civilization would fall apart. I mean, imagine a situation in which everybody's going off doing their own things. Nobody is cooperating on any sort of task. Everyone only wants to do what each individual wants to do, uh, and there's no point in, in trying to make group consensus work. That's a nightmare situation in which you have people uh, forming into camps of uh, mutual interest and doing everything that they can to sabotage the other camps. <laughs> I mean, it kind of sounds like politics today. The, a better situation would be a situation where we can form a group consensus uh, and try to make things work. And that's what Ash was really interested in. One of the other points to make is that Ash's research has for years been misrepresented. This point was very nicely made by uh, three researchers, Ronald Friend, Yvonne Rafferty and Dana Brimel in a 19, uh, 1990 paper where they basically showed that all the different textbooks are misrepresenting what Ash found. There seems to be a situation here where everybody is saying the wrong thing about the Ash studies and because everyone else is saying the wrong thing other people follow. So we're in a giant Ash experiment in the way that the Ash experiment gets described. <laughs> <laughs> which is ironic, but I, I think friend, I think Ronald Friend is correct. Ash was really interested in showing how people remain independent 
uh, while trying to work for uh, group consensus simultaneously. And that comes out really nicely in some of the results that seldom get reported. When Ash gave his participants the opportunity to secretly record their answers. So you have a group situation where the people in the group are saying things aloud, but the true subject is also given the opportunity to give the answer secretly in writing. They give the right answer. The vast majority of the time they are correct. So this conformity is on the surface only. It doesn't translate into true belief. So now, uh, when we line up these two different uh, experiments, the Sharif and the Ash experiment, the, the key thing here is to remember that for the Sharif experiment, reality was ambiguous. And in the Ash experiment, reality is, is obvious. These are two different types of social influence. The uh, ambiguous reality uh, situation is one where you need to have information from other people to help you decide what's going on and that information is uh, that's why we call it informational influence informational influence occurs when you when there's no clear answer and you're looking for guidance from others who you think might have the answer I mean it's sort of a natural thing to do if you don't know how to interpret something go look at uh, someone else's interpretation and see if it makes sense. Now that might uh, in turn anchor your own perception or interpretation of your perception and thereby change your answers. You wouldn't be aware of that necessarily. You would not be aware that the information in, in the ambiguous situation like the uh, Sharif study, you would not be aware that that information is changing how you think about the thing that you're observing. You would have, in, uh, because you're not aware of the, the, ch the influence, you're not aware of the social influence, that results in inner acceptance of the thing that you're responding to. Whereas in the Ash study, everybody knew that the answer was wrong. The participants all knew that the answer was wrong. And in fact, in, in Ash's textbook where he goes on at greater length, there's some qualitative analysis where uh, quotations from the participants are given. And some of the quotations are really quite nice, where people are rationalizing things and saying, well, you know, they were good people. They must have known what they were talking about. You know, it makes me wonder if, uh, I mean, I know what I saw, but uh, it makes me wonder if I was really correct. And sometimes they just flat out say that they, they wanted to go along with the group uh, and that they, they didn't want to be rude. So uh, when we consider the second part of this table that we have on the board here, uh, in the ash type of experiment, reality is obvious. The, the type of social pressure is what we call normative social influence. And that's the, the social influence that happens when everybody is doing one thing and you feel like you have to go along with them. It doesn't change your mind about things. You know that you're doing something because everybody else is doing it, uh, at least if they're doing something that is observably wrong and you go along with it. The interesting thing, though, is that the vast majority of time when people are doing something that may be wrong, you may not be aware that it's wrong. You may just take it for granted that, well, this is how we've always done things, and so I'm going to go along with the group. You don't quite get the feel of, of that tension until you can see uh, clearly that they're doing something that's wrong or unethical or uh, perhaps if you're in a different culture, you're visiting another country, and you can see that they're doing things totally different than the way that you do things. Uh, and that's kind of a cool sensation, I think. Uh, I like that sort of thing. I like to go to other countries and experience how they deal with different things. Uh, I mean, it could just be something as simple as being seated at a restaurant, you know, or, or um, how they deal with uh, waiting online for uh, getting into a museum. Some things that we completely take for granted in our society, which we don't see that it's, it can be done differently until we're in another society. And that too would be normative influence. Now in the, um, in the next video, the one that uh, I've actually already produced it, but I'll line it up after this one, uh, I talk about how I joined a cult in 1980, 1980 when I was 16 years old 
And so what I'd like you to do as you listen to that video where I joined the Moonies uh, it's at the age of 16, I want you to think about the Ash and Sharif types of social influence as they pertain to the cult indoctrination.